straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. College student Molly Tibbetts' convicted killer wants a new trial. The judge now considering the words of one inmate against another. He says, reset him up. He did not kill him. The so-called killer clown cold case trial gets delayed. When will we know who really was under the mask? I don't think I've ever had a case that is closer to a movie. And wealthy donor Ed Buck convicted in the overdose deaths of two men in his house in a party and play scheme. He the monster has stolen this bright light. Plus, the family of Samantha Josephson in tears. Her killer, fake Uber driver Nathaniel Rowland, sentenced to life in prison. The defendant's mother clashing with the judge. He didn't do this. Well, but, I'm not going to hear any yes, claim of what okay. he did or didn't do. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A judge in Iowa is now considering whether the convicted killer of college student Molly Tibbetts should get a new trial. A jury found Christian Bahena Rivera guilty of first-degree murder of Molly Tibbetts in May. He led investigators to her body in a cornfield in August 2018. At trial, he claimed other men killed her and forced him to move her body. And now, his attorneys are asking for a new trial after an inmate is coming forward claiming another inmate confessed that he stabbed Tibbetts to death as part of a sex trafficking attempt gone wrong. There, he heard a noise from a room. He opened the door, he seen a woman bound to a chair and gagged. And was he able to identify that woman? He, he, later on he did, he went upstairs and said that if the police went to the next house over, they would have caught her. And I said, who's that? Tibbetts. And that's when the sick trafficker said that, that he had to get rid of her. So he went back down there and stabbed her to death and then put her in a tarp. On cross-examination, prosecutors pointed out that the inmate who allegedly confessed was only 17 years old at the time. He's reportedly told the Associated Press he had nothing to do with Tibbetts' death. And you stated in one of those interviews that Gavin Jones told you that he and this under, other individual cut up Molly's body, correct? Yes. Are you aware that the facts of the case and the evidence do not show that particular fact? Um, I don't know, but that's, that's what he did tell me, but I didn't believe him. And you went to prison in November of 2020, correct? Left October 19th. You went to prison on October 19th, 2020? Yes. And you didn't tell anyone about these statements that Gavin Jones supposedly made to you until May 26th of this year, correct? Correct. The defense then asked the lead investigator if he ever received tips during the death investigation that Molly Tibbetts was a victim of sex trafficking. It's possible. There was a, I, we had tips that she was eating ice cream in Sioux Falls and eating tacos in Denver, Colorado. So it, it would not surprise me if there were tips that she was a victim of sex trafficking. Wouldn't you agree, sir, that if you had that information in that month that Molly Tibbetts was missing, that that would be relevant information? Well, I suppose it de would depend when I got that information. If I got that information after Christian Rivera confessed and took us to the body and uh, we were able to corroborate his entire confession, then I probably would have disregarded that. Prosecutors were quick to point out all the evidence used to convict the defendant in the murder. That lead that was developed off of that video from Logan Collins' residence was essentially the lead that broke open this case, correct? That is true, and, yes. Uh, Christian Rivera was tied to that Chevy Malibu uh, through a vehicle stop, well, not a vehicle stop, but an interaction that Steve Kivy had with him uh, in August of 2018, correct? That is correct. That vehicle, was found later to contain the blood of Molly Tibbetts, correct? That is correct. And he ended up confessing to the death or to the killing of Molly Tibbetts, correct? Yes, he did. Any connection at all through your investigation to Gavin Jones, Dustin Hansen, James Lowe, or anyone else other than Christian 
Rivera. No, Christian Rivera murdered Molly Tibbetts. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Gigi Gonzalez and Terry Austin. Gigi, what kind of and how much information does the judge need to grant a new trial? You know, it's not so much volume, it's just got to be material enough that if it's introduced to a jury, it could likely induce a different verdict. And here, jailhouse informant with no incentive other than to do what is right is stepping forward and saying that there is a different defendant and a different set of circumstances uh, revolving the, uh, around this case. So it could be very persuasive to a juror if they did hear that. Now, Terry, does the fact that the defense argument and this supposed confession slightly differ work against the defense? Well, yes, it will work against the defense. Listen, I think what the prosecution is trying to say here is that Bahena Rivera confessed to this murder. All of the evidence points to that original confession, and he's trying now to backtrack. These other individuals who are saying that two other men came and killed her and asked Rivera to hide the body, that is not connecting with the evidence that the prosecution found. So I think that the jury might be confused, and I think that we could potentially ultimately hear all of this evidence. But, you know, really, I think that that original confession should stand. Right. We'll see how the judge decides this. The judge has said that he would give a written ruling on the issue. And of course, when he does, we'll be here to break it all down for you on Law and Crime Daily. Thank you both. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a jury's verdict for political donor Ed Buck on trial for trading drugs and sex, leading to the deaths of two men. But first, when will we know who was the real face under the clown mask that shot a Florida mother? The latest in the killer clown cold case, next. Welcome back. A delay in a long-anticipated killer clown trial in Florida. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy spoke with the Palm Beach County prosecutor about the case and the delay. Brian, Sheila Keen Warren's murder trial was expected to start in September, but the defense asked for a delay, and they got it. When will you be ready to try this case? Judge, I, we are thinking end of March, beginning of April. And with that, the trial of Sheila Keen Warren was delayed until March 2022. The Florida woman is accused of dressing up like a clown, getting out of a Chrysler LeBaron, and shooting and killing Marlene Warren in May of 1990 in the doorway of her home. Marlene Warren was the wife of Keen Warren's current husband, Michael Warren. This is a cold case from 1990, so it's frustrating for the victim's family and for us prosecutors that it continues to be delayed. But... We respect the court's decision and we'll be ready early next year. Palm Beach County State's Attorney Dave Ehrenberg initially sought the death penalty against Keen Warren, but later took it off the table. She was indicted in 2017 for Marlene Warren's murder. There are reasons why the defendant is alleged to have done this by dressing up as a clown. I can't get into the evidence of the case because it's a pending matter, uh, but at trial, uh, there will be. Uh, evidence as to why the defendant uh, did what she did. Ehrenberg says advances in DNA and other technology helped identify Keen Warren as the killer clown. But what about her now husband, Michael Warren? The husband has not been charged with any crime relating to this murder. And uh, that is something that we do not have the evidence yet to file charges against anyone else at this point. Now, the defense attorneys said they wanted to delay the trial because they said they were still receiving discovery and had other witnesses that they hoped to depose in the case to help them prepare for trial. That trial now scheduled to begin in March of 2022. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Back with us is criminal defense attorney Gigi Gonzalez and Terry Austin. Terry, the case is described as being completely circumstantial. So what kind of evidence should we expect in this trial? You know, I think what most people don't realize is that a lot of cases are tried with circumstantial evidence. That just means that the jury or the fact finder has to infer from the evidence versus direct evidence, which would be an eyewitness or a video or a confession. And you don't often have that. So here it does seem as though it's going to be all circumstantial. 
but the prosecution is holding that close to the vest. So I think we will see this DNA evidence, as Anjanette reported, or we might hear something about the car that was used during this murder. So I think they're going to put all of that circumstantial evidence together, and the jury will be able to make a decision. Yeah, I would tend to agree both on how trials typically are and how this may be proved by the prosecution. Gigi, the prosecution has said there was a reason Keen Warren wore a clown outfit, but hasn't said why. Any guesses as to why? I think she did it for the element of surprise, even though clowns are kind of scary, at least to me they're kind of scary. But you might open the door to a clown that's got balloons and flowers, which was the whole goal of the defendant here was to get the door open so that she could shoot her in the face. Allegedly, that's what the state's going to say. That's my guess. That would show consciousness of guilt as well as a plan to commit the murder. So that could kind of check off the boxes here for the prosecution. And Jeanette, why did the state's attorney take the death penalty off the table? Well, you know, Brian, Dave Ehrenberg said they have DNA evidence in this case, and they have other evidence that came to them through advances in technology. And he thinks that they can definitely prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. However, he said that the laws in the state of Florida have changed regarding the death penalty. Things have gotten tougher. And he said only once in the last 20 years has a jury in Palm Beach County been willing to um, sentence or recommend a sentence of death for a defendant in a murder trial. So they just decided to forego it and just present the case and go for just a conviction on murder, whatever that penalty may be. So it looks like the prosecution is deciding that the landscape in that county would not grant uh, death penalty. They're kind of picking their battles. It makes sense to go for a sure thing rather than something they may not be able to attain. Thank you all for contributing. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, the appeals court decision for the making a murder defendant, Stephen Avery. Plus, the secret witness in the Robert Durst trial revealed. Find out what the defendant's friend said about the real estate heir charged in the murder of his best friend next. Welcome back. Let's check in on the day's top legal stories, including a jury finding Democratic donor Ed Buck guilty in the overdose deaths of two men he offered drugs for sex. Ed Buck was convicted of nine felony counts in federal court on Tuesday. Prosecutors say Buck lured two black men back to his apartment to consume drugs in exchange for sex acts, in a practice described as party and play. Gamel Moore and Timothy Dean died of methamphetamine overdoses at Buck's home in 2017 and 2019. He now faces up to life in prison and separate charges in Los Angeles District Court. In Wisconsin, the Court of Appeals is denying a claim by convicted murderer Stephen Avery. He's serving a life sentence for the murder of Teresa Hallbuck on Halloween 2005. After Avery's case gained attention from the Netflix series Making a Murderer, a lawyer filed an appeal claiming she had new evidence that would exonerate him. But in a unanimous opinion, the Wisconsin Court of Appeals ruled Avery's claims were insufficient and the trial court didn't err in not granting a hearing. Avery's lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, tweeted, not deterred by the appellate court decision, it pointed out the specific doors that are still open for Mr. Avery's quest for freedom. Avery's nephew, Brendan Dacey, is also serving a life sentence for Hallbuck's murder. And in California, prosecutors appear to be wrapping up their case against real estate heir Robert Durst. Durst is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, in December 2000. In court, prosecutors played the recorded testimony of the defendant's longtime friend, Nick Shaven. Shaven testified in 2017 that Durst admitted to killing his wife, Kathy, in 1982. Prosecutors alleged Durst killed Berman because she threatened to go forward with information about Durst's involvement in Kathy's death. Durst has pled not guilty. The U.S. government has sold the one-of-a-kind Wu-Tang Clan album once owned by farmer bro Martin Shirelli. The Department of Justice didn't say how much the Once Upon a Time in Shaolin album was bought for, but records show Screlly paid more than $2 million for it in 2015. The sale will go towards satisfying a $7.4 million forfeiture Screlly was ordered to pay up. The former hedge fund manager was convicted of engaging in security fraud schemes. He's currently in prison, serving a seven-year sentence. Now to a story that's a bit stinkier. Police in Indiana are urging a serial pooper to seek professional assistance immediately. Officers and fishers say a woman has been defecating in yards on her daily runs. The unnamed plopper even apparently brought toilet paper with her, the discarded evidence neighbors would later find. 
The dastardly deed led locals to putting up these signs designating no pooping zones. The Fishers Police Department says she won't face criminal charges for now, but are encouraging her to seek medical aid. When we come back, the emotional victim impact statements as a father confronts his daughter's convicted killer and the defendant's mother fighting back with the judge next. Welcome back. A South Carolina man was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison for murdering a college student who got into his car thinking it was her Uber ride. A jury convicted Nathaniel Rowland for kidnapping and murdering 21-year-old Samantha Josephson. Video from outside a bar in Columbia on March 29, 2019, shows Josephson getting into the backseat of Rowland's Chevy Impala. Cell phone records from the defendant shows his phone traveling near the bar and where her body was found hours later. Investigators say she fought back, stabbed more than 120 times, an image her parents say they can't get out of their minds. I have visions of her foot on the back window. I have visions of her screaming and fighting. I have visions of her taking her last breath. I have such hatred running through me. I still, to this day, can't believe she is gone. I keep waiting for her to walk through the door, saying, hey, only the way she does. The defendant's mother spoke on his behalf, but her refusal to accept her son's guilt only seemed to upset the judge. The state have accused our son of a crime that he haven't, didn't commit. You know, I'm not going to okay. hear All right. any claim of, of innocence. Okay. He's been convicted okay. by the jury. Okay. I know my son didn't do this. I know. How do you but, know that? Sir. How do you know that? By the way I raised him. Pardon? By the, by the way I raised him. And when you are a mother, and you are a truly good mother, and you raise your child in the right way, you would know when that child had done something or did something right or wrong. I can't. I can't. And I know he didn't do this. Ma'am, I'm not going to hear any yes, claim that of what okay. he did or didn't do. Yes, he is guilty of murder. He's yes, guilty of, of kidnapping. Yes, He's guilty of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. Then the defendant gave a brief statement before being sentenced to life in prison. I just wish the state would have would have done more in finding out who the actual person was. Instead of being satisfied with with detaining me and proving my guilt. As high a standard as the law requires all points to your guilt, and I am absolutely satisfied. I can certainly understand the family being in total disbelief that the child that they raised could do such a heinous thing, could commit such a murder. I have dealt with the heartless and you fall into that category. A person without any remorse whatsoever. Gigi, a lot was said after the verdict. Your reaction to the defendant and his mother's statements in court? You know, a lot of times these verdicts and sentencings, they're more shocking to the families involved in the situation than the actual defendant. Now, I'm not surprised by the mother's plea to the judge here. You know, I, I'm sure she's ex especially shocked to hear not only the verdict, but to also make a statement in defense of her son asking for leniency in his sentencing here in, in, in this case. Um, it's obvious that neither statements had any effect on the judge's ruling, and I do have to remark how compassionate this judge was in the rendering of the sentencing here. Absolutely. Now, Terry, speaking of the judge, you've been a big fan of his uh, since almost day one. How did he handle the sentencing of the murder that sparked the rideshare safety movement? 
You're right, Brian. I am a huge fan of this judge. I think he handled the sentence perfectly. He gave the maximum, and he explained why. He said that this individual had a depraved heart. He explained, and this was good for the family of the victim, that Samantha put up an amazing fight, and she left sufficient evidence for the jury to come back with the correct verdict. And I think that was very helpful. He also said that in all of his 40 years, Brian, that law enforcement did the best job he had ever seen. So he's talking about the case that the prosecution put on and the fact that they put on an excellent case. And at the end, he said, this is not a very difficult sentencing. It's a very easy sentencing. And that's exactly why he sentenced this, this individual to the maximum sentence. Now, Terry, we see this, and I think I ask this question after every trial when we get a verdict and a sentence. We know the defense is going to make an appeal. It's his right to do so. Do you see any appellate issues, any errors by the judge or anyone that may grant this uh, defendant a new trial? You know, Brian, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. When you have a judge like this who carefully considers all of the evidence, there were no voir dire issues. Nothing was left out. Nothing was put in that shouldn't have been. I don't think there's any ground here for any sort of appeal or a new trial. I think this was a tight case, and I think the conviction will hold, and so will the sentencing. All right, Gigi, Terry, as always, thank you for contributing, and thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America here on the Law & Crime Daily. Always a pleasure to have you. Have a good night.